All right. Next one, we've got Christian Brana, who's going to be talking to us about supervising and emulating system calls. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Christian. I'm one of the Lexi maintainers. Mostly work on the kernel, though. And the is it grim? Maybe it's not yeah, high up enough. Keep it differently. Keep it differently. Okay. Is this better? Is it better if I still keep my head this way? Okay. Um, right. I'm going to talk to you about supervising and emulating um, syscalls and how we make use of this uh, inside of LexD. So just a brief introduction. I'm not going to explain what syscalls are, but think of it like a sort of a way that allows user space to communicate with the kernel, make a request, for example, open a file for me, write something somewhere, and so on. So like a fancy request handler, simplified. And so obviously, in a lot of scenarios, you kind of have use cases where you, where you run an app, and per se, there is nothing restricting this app from making any kind of syscall it wants. I mean, ignore the permission checking that the kernel performs, but in general, the app can just, if it knows the syscall number and how to do syscalls, it can just ask the kernel, perform something for me. And for a lot of apps, you might want to restrict them in the way they can request something from the kernel. You want to, for example, just allow them a certain set of syscalls, not all of them. Um, you might want to restrict how it can call a specific syscall with what arguments and so on. And this is sort of where most operating systems have kind of a similar concept, but on Linux, this, the, um, the part of the kernel that is responsible for allowing you to do such sandboxing um, is seccomp. Um, so it allows you to intercept system calls and then denies or allows them. Usually, for example, um, a container runtime that runs privilege at least would uh, block a syscall that is called open by handle add because with symlink trickery you can open any file on the host system uh, that you want. And so what usually is done, it returns enosys. So second profile is loaded for that application and then if the, the application makes a syscall, open by handle at return enosys or eperm or whatever to tell the application you cannot use the syscall. This is off limits. Um, so you can see where this is going, right? You can have blacklists and whitelists and so on. And most container runtimes make use of this um, in some form or other. Um, but one of, the, um, so one of the limiting things is that the kernel actually never blocks. So the policy, to some extent, is not fully dynamic, right? So you can't really do something. Um, if an application performs the syscall, uh, stop it and wait for me, for example, to tell you what, what you're supposed to do. That's not possible with SECOM. Well, it was not possible with SECOM. But that would open up a lot of interesting, uh, interesting possibilities and would extend how you can sandbox application uh, in a much more fine-grained way. Um, and there's an interesting, um, interesting fact that you should keep in mind for the later part of the presentation. That is, second never run, or runs before the syscall number is looked up in the syscall table. So what the kernel is usually does, right? You request a syscall and uh, you pass down a number in a specific register dependent on the architecture. And the kernel then takes this number and is like, hmm, I'm looking up in the syscall table the corresponding syscall and then call it. But if obviously if this syscall number doesn't exist in the syscall table, right, then the kernel will tell you this syscall doesn't exist. Second runs before that. If you know where I'm going with this. But if not, I'm explaining in a little bit. Um, so right, so a second never blocks. What could you do if it actually were you to enable, if, if it actually would block? Well, there will be a lot of interesting use cases like um, what we wanted to do is to load a profile that specifies if the application performs the make not syscall, right? Um, then I want the kernel to not deny or allow it. I want the kernel to wait for me to tell it what, uh, what it's supposed to return to user space. So the kernel blocks and waits for a response from the corresponding process to tell it what to do. And this is exactly what the second notifier um, is doing. It's been something that's been toyed around with uh, in various forms. And uh, the guy who implemented this is actually here, Tycho, um, who did the original kernel work for this. Um, yeah, so 
one of the factors is that uh, seccomp asks user space for the return value and anno, but the execution does never uh, continue, usually doesn't continue in the kernel. So um, if the, if this, if the uh, application performs a syscall, for example, a make not syscall, and it blocks, um, the only thing that we can do right now um, is uh, that we emulate the syscall in user space, right? Um, do we have I'm going to give a demo about this in a little bit. Um, so what this allows you to do is basically fake any, well, fake any kind of syscall may be wrong, but um, you can very much expand what you can do with containers right now. So containers come, we, we touched upon this in the first talk, I think, where somebody asked, what are the limitations that you usually experience with unprivileged containers, which are the containers that you should use because they're actually safe? or way safer than, uh, than privileged containers. Well, you can do a lot of things, right? If you want to mount any kind of block device inside of a container, the kernel will not allow you to do this. Because usually file systems in the kernel are not able to protect themselves against malicious images. So if you allow an unprivileged user to mount uh, any kind of image that has been given, stick in a USB stick, mount it, and so on, you could crash the kernel easily. Uh, in user namespaces, you're also not allowed to do any kind of make not syscalls, right? Um, if you could, you could create, I don't know, def kmem, def mem, whatever it is, and then write into random kernel memory as an unprivileged user. It would also be pretty bad. So there's quite a bunch of uh, limitations, and this obviously means that uh, most user space tools uh, have not been written with containers, and especially not been written been, uh, with the user namespaced or, or unprivileged containers um, in mind, and it's kind of a catch-up game where user space is slowly accepting containers to be a common thing, and usually tools that get written nowadays will... Um, will take care to exact function in user namespaces. But a lot of old tools, I don't know, fake root or whatever, they will usually try to create device nodes and so on, and then they're running in a container, and there is no, there is no good reason why they shouldn't be allowed to run in a container. But they will fail. Um, but we also don't want to... You know, I mean, the obvious solution, if, if we're thinking about the make not case that you could throw in my face, is why not have a whitelist of devices inside of the kernel that we deem safe, and if... You know, that's kind of messy, then you get into kind of game, kind of a catch-up game where you have to wait on the kernel version and that gets you the right device node and whether it's safe or not. And oftentimes, uh, especially for the container case, right, you have a container manager and you have the container, and the container manager is sort of your, your main authority apart from the kernel. The kernel denies things that are globally unsafe, and uh, your container manager will usually be able to judge whether or not a specific operation is allowed for that container. So it will usually have an idea of the workload. Well, not necessarily, but for a lot of containers, it will know what's the workload. Can I trust this process inside of the container? Do I think a specific syscall is safe and so on? Um, and there was no way, uh, there was previously no nice way um, to actually delegate this power to the container manager itself. And this is where the second notifier really becomes powerful. Um, so. You load a second profile, and uh, make not syscall doesn't work. Um, but now you have this second profile that stops the process when it performs the make not syscall, right? Right before it's before it's even looked up in the kernel in the syscall table, um, and then it sends you a message on a on a file descriptor, um, and the user space process that is supervising the container can then inspect the arguments and so on of the uh, of the uh, of the syscall. Uh, for the container, and then make, by, based on that, make an informed decision. Say, for example, it's safe. He just wants to c uh, create the console inside of the container and not something really malicious. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the general idea. And then deny it uh, or allow it. As you see, the, cur the concrete implementation is you load a, sec a task, the container loads a second profile, and then it gets an FD for this profile, and this FD is the so-called notifier FD, this it can then hand off to uh, the container manager, like the Docker, Podman, whatever, or Conmon. Um, and then it can be registered in an epoch loop, in an event loop, or in whatever form, and then you can wait for events on it. And every time a syscall that is registered in the filter for the container is made, uh, the supervising manager will get an event on the notifier FD, can then receive the syscall arguments, what syscall is made and has been made, and so on, inspect it, inspect the arguments, uh, and then do whatever it wants, and at the end tell the kernel, tell the process the syscall succeeded, or tell the process the syscall uh, failed. 
Excellent. Um, so uh, maybe I do the demo first, and then we. This is uh, the gist of it. But we've expanded this quite a bit over the last <coughs> times. This is too small, right? Better. Okay, I have. How do I do this? <laughs> so, I have a container running here. Not running, apparently. <laughs> but uh, so I can start a container. Let's go with the F1 and clear. And as we are the LXD project, we run full system containers, as you can see. And we are in an, one second, we are in an unprivileged container. Oop, UID map. And for the really suspicious GID map. So uh, what we can't do, obviously, is stuff like this. Uh, wait, let me see. No, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> whatever. Make not BBB C. That is basically a. Uh, uh, make me a device node called BBB. I know the arguments are really terrible. Uh, C is character device, uh, and five is co console. Five one is console in any case. But the kernel will not allow you to do this at all. Like this is this is off limits um, because you could create any device node otherwise, and there is no static device list in the kernel and so on, as I said. So um, now USB stick. X4 file system, uh, so I'm not, that's for a later part of the demo, so don't get suspicious. So um, now we can, let's see, config set f1 security dot syscalls dot intercept dot make not true. And now, because Currently, second profiles can't be reloaded dynamically. Restart F1. Go inside. Let's try the same exercise again. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, you can see we don't we don't fool you. There is no mount or any, oops. Well. This is an actual device node. And it's the comps that. Yeah, it's the character special device node. And so what we did, obviously, is we haven't changed the kernel. I haven't rebooted the kernel and so on. What we did is we used the second notifier. The second notifier sent a message to, uh, to the Lexi daemon, said this container wants to make a make not syscall. And then the Lexi daemon was like, ah, oh, OK. Let me look at the arguments. And then we have a whitelist in Lexi that states, for example, dev console, yeah, whatever, totally fine. Um, and performs the make not action for you, emulates it in user space, so to speak. Um, if I were to change this to block device, it hopefully fails. Well, yeah, obviously it fails. I mean. Oh, this is, I know why, it is, uh, why this still works, because I uh, modified the demo to allow me any device node, but good. Um, <laughs> because I wanted to show cool sh uh, stuff. Um, the same, uh, so you can obviously, this is a very, well, it's an interesting use case, because it allows you to, ru to run tools like um, fake root and so on. Uh, but it's not the most interesting use case. The more interesting use case is uh, currently we're very limited in the way that, so if you request from us, from the Lexi daemon, that we mount something for you, so uh, the user on the host types something in and states, I want this mount to appear in the container, then we can already do that. Like we can inject mounts, no problem whatsoever. But often when you have a tool running inside of the container, right, we currently had no way to intercept this syscall. We had no way, no way of knowing that it actually wanted to mount something that we consider to be safe. So what you can do is you can also intercept the, five minutes, you can also intercept um, the mount syscall and then make it possible to have various stuff mounted in your container. So let's start with, uh, that's mount, right? And then 
allowed, and we state that it's fine to mount, let's say, x4. Uh, and f1. And, whoops. I should have a device node in there, hopefully. <coughs> So I have a file system. Ah, I should probably. So let me briefly remove this. And the reason is that I want to show you that it actually doesn't work by default. Uh, shall have one clear. And so if you do mount slash dev sdb, which is an xd4 file system, and try to mount it, the kernel will tell you, no, this is off limits, because it could be a malicious image. You're trying to crash me, whatever. Like. Um, but if we and set this allowed and do a restart, now I do the mount. Ah, there it is. So. Because we have uh, in our policy allowed X4 mounts, uh, uh, Lexi Demon will now intercept these syscalls, and then and if you call mount from inside of the container, it will mount the X4 file system for you. The problem, obviously, with this is that um, it's only safe if you do it uh, if you do it via fuse. So instead of uh, enabling the file system, we also allow you uh, to set an option where you can rewrite it to fuse. So any mount, any X4 mount inside of the container will be done via fuse, which is safe. That's a safe user space implementation of this. It's the only way you can safely do this. But if you know your workload and you know in this unprivileged container is running something that um, can only have ever access to specific types of device nodes. Um, then it's probably also fine if you set the allowed property. The cool thing is, um, or one of the limitations that we've recently gotten rid of, which just got released, uh, a patch that I merged for 5.5, is um, we now also allow you to continue syscalls. Because what I said is um, the kernel never continues syscalls from user space. Actually, this is now possible when you set a specific, when you tell the kernel to do so. But be aware, this cannot be used to implement the security policy at all. Um, it is only possible. Uh, it is only possible if you are sure um, that if you continue and an attacker. So imagine the following scenario: so uh, a container performs a syscall, it gets stopped, and you now uh, inspect the arguments. And then after this, based on the arguments that you copied out, you make a decision and you say continue this syscall. An attacker with equal privilege could rewrite the syscall arguments in the meantime. So you need to be sure that if that happens, the kernel will still be sufficiently, uh, sufficiently uh, protecting you. Um, yeah, I actually have more, but I think we're out of time. Oh, if you try to just do the demo very quickly while people ask questions or whatever, I don't, I don't know. But like, you still have about a minute. I don't have your expertise in doing demos very quickly. Uh. Um, but I also want to uh, take a chance to take, uh, to take okay. questions. Uh, we do have the actual instructions for that on the uh, release post for XD319. So if you want to try it for yourself, we do have the explanation for how to do that, the demo he was going to do. There is more features coming. Uh, Sargon, uh, someone from, uh, from Netflix, has worked on a new syscall that I've merged for 5.6 um, that also allows you to retrieve file descriptors, which means that will also allow you to, at some point, bridge sockets. So you can intercept, get an FD from the task that you intercepted, and then connect it. Uh, connected to a different port or a different IP address, whatever you want. So uh, it's a pretty cool feature. We can take one question. Um, if the attacker with equal privilege could change the parameters, why not to make an, another option to allow uh, the application to be blocked while the security check is being done? Because Sorry. this way you could actually use this as a security mechanism. I think I, I have really bad ears, so I didn't understand so, it. Um, you mentioned that um, you cannot use this as a security mechanism right. because the attacker can move, uh, change the right. parameters while there's a check or an erase condition. So why not make an extra option for the application to be blocked while the check is being done? And this way, this could be a security mechani mechanism. No. Yeah, if you want. 
It does. It simply, simply. So the work. the thread itself is frozen yeah, when when you hit in that. The, the problem, problem is the problem, if you're multi-threaded. Yeah, well, the, uh, not only multi-threaded, but also the issue that um, seccomp um, at the time when seccomp is running, um, the kernel has not copied any of the memory. So as soon as you get out of seccomp uh, and into the actual handler in the kernel, that logic there will read again from user space. So you can use it to do a quick check and deny, but you cannot really do any more because otherwise the value might still change underneath you, and that's just because of where seccomp is in the stack. So yeah. that comes back to my point about uh, running before uh, running before it's looked up in the syscall table. So the sys obviously the syscall in memory has not been performed. Actual memory copying happens in the actual syscall. It's well, it mostly in the actual syscall itself. Um, the cool thing is that um, which I haven't demoed. Uh, I have a demo for this. Um, is that you can invent syscalls with this because it runs, that's why I pointed out, it runs before the system call number is looked up in the system call table. So technically you could, for example, say um, some random number that is now, then that I invented as a new syscall is a way to communicate to LexD to perform a certain kind of operation for you and that syscall doesn't even need to exist on the kernel. So technically, even if you're an older kernel, we could, for example, say, oh, it doesn't have this syscall, let's yes. emulate it in user space. Yeah, you can emulate missing syscalls with it. You can prototype new syscalls with it. You can do a lot of really weird stuff. Okay, and we're out of time. Thank you very much.